The state of Missouri has voted to remain in the Union, but tensions are strong between Unionists and secessionists who are fighting for control of the state. Missouri Governor Claiborne Fox Jackson is pro-secession and upon the firing on Fort Sumter rejects calls to provide four regiments on the basis that it was illegal, unconstitutional, inhuman, and diabolical. Not one man would the state of Missouri furnish to carry on such an unholy cause, he said. Missouri played a vital role in the early stages of the war for its strategic location, being that it was on the Missouri and the Mississippi rivers, and it had manpower and natural resources. The federal government made an important effort to make sure the state remained loyal to the Union. Most citizens in the state desired neutrality, but many, including the governor, were sympathetic to the Southern cause. Missouri was asked to supply four regiments when President Lincoln called for troops, but Governor Jackson refused and instead ordered the state militia to muster at Camp Jackson outside of St. Louis and prepare to seize the U.S. arsenal in the city. This proved to be a much more complicated task than originally believed, as the arsenal's commander, Captain Nathaniel Lyon, was resourceful and secretly had the weapons moved to Illinois and marched 7,000 men to Camp Jackson to force its surrender on May 10th. In June, Lyon met with Governor Jackson in an attempt to resolve their differences an attempt that proved futile. Now promoted to Brigadier General, Lyon marched his army up the Missouri River and captured Jefferson City, the state capital. Governor Jackson is forced to retreat to southwest Missouri with elements of the state guard after an unsuccessful stand at Boonville a few miles upstream. With Missouri now under Union control, General Lyon installed a pro-Union state government and picked up reinforcements. With this, Lyon moved towards southwest Missouri and by July 13th was encamped at Springfield with about 6,000 soldiers, consisting of the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 5th Missouri Infantry Regiments the 1st Iowa Infantry, the 1st and 2nd Kansas Infantry, several companies of regular Army Infantry and Cavalry, and three batteries of artillery. 75 miles southwest of Springfield, Confederate Major General Sterling Price, commanding the Missouri State Guard, is drilling 5,200 soldiers. Sterling Price was a 51-year-old Missouri native who served in the Missouri House of Representatives and the United States Congress before the outbreak of the Mexican-American War when he resigned from public office and was appointed Colonel of the 2nd Missouri and became military governor of New Mexico. He had experience in the Taos Revolt and at the Battle of Santa Cruz de Rosales. Afterwards, he served as governor of Missouri from 1853 to 1857, after which he presided over the Missouri Convention that opposed secession in March of 1861. His acceptance of command of the Confederate Missouri Militia is a result of disagreements between himself and Unionists. By the end of July, the Confederates had built up a coalition force exceeding 12,000 men when troops under Generals Ben McCulloch and N. Bart Pierce rendezvoused with Price. The plan was to capture Lyon's Union Army and regain control of the state. On July 31st, the Confederates marched northeast to attack the Federals, 
lion march from Springfield on August 1st in hopes of surprising the Confederates. The Southern Vanguard at Doug Springs was mauled the next day, but Lyon realized he was outnumbered and ordered a withdrawal back to Springfield. The Confederates were in pursuit and made camp near Wilson's Creek on August 6th. Despite being outnumbered, Lyon decided to attack the Confederates, leaving 1,000 men in Springfield to guard his supplies. Lyon led 5,400 soldiers out of Springfield on the, on the night of August 9th. The plan was for 1,200 men under Union Colonel Franz Seigel to swing wide to the south and flank the Confederate right, while the main body struck from the north. Surprise was a key element in the plan. Ironically, the Confederates also planned a surprise attack. But rain on the night of the night caused McCulloch, who was now in overall command, to cancel the operation. The pickets, who were called in advance, were not ordered back to their posts, leaving the Confederate Army open to a surprise attack. At 5 o'clock a.m. on August 10th, Seigel's troops were in position on the east side of Wilson's Creek, overlooking the main Confederate cavalry camp, which included unarmed Missourians. An hour earlier, Lyon advanced and encountered foraging rebels who fled south. Lyon formed his lead units into line and continued forward. The fleeing rebels reported the Federals to Brigadier General James Spencer Raines, who sent couriers south to alert McCulloch and Price. Raines then formed a cavalry unit on the northern spur of Bloody Hill, as it will soon be called. At 5 o'clock a.m., Lyon's artillery opened fire to the north as planned. The events have been set in motion. The Battle of Wilson's Creek has begun. Lyon advanced and forced the Missourians south towards the hill's crest. The rest of Rain's command was there in line, but they were easily pushed down the slope toward the main southern camps. The Union Army now held Bloody Hill, the most important area of the battlefield. Lyon is now keen on securing his left flank and sent a U.S. regular infantry battalion across the creek to carry forward the left flank of the attack. At about 6.30 a.m., they are pushed back in defeat to rejoin Lyon. By 7.30, the Confederates had gained and secured the eastern section of the battlefield. Price and McCulloch are eating breakfast together at the base of Bloody Hill, having received two couriers with information regarding 20,000 Union soldiers and 10 pieces of artillery, which McCulloch did not believe the first. The two generals had not yet heard the sound of battle due to acoustic shadow, which was a common phenomena during the Civil War. They were quick to respond, issuing orders to meet the enemy. Confederate artillery opened fire across the creek opposite Bloody Hill, slow, slowing Lyon's advance and buying valuable time for Southerners to form and advance up Bloody Hill. Seigel's guns opened fire on the cavalry camps on Q having heard Lyon's opening guns. The Federals crossed Wilson's Creek and moved north as much of the Confederate troops fled. At the far end of the camps, Texas Cavalry formed into line of battle, but were forced to withdraw when Seigel's guns opened on them. By 8.30, the Union Army held the wire road and captured dozens of Confederates 
to try to escape the fighting. Saigo determined to hold his position as he assumed Lion was driving the enemy south. He sent out skirmishers and did not attempt to contact Lion. Decisions that helped determine the outcome of the battle. McCulloch led a portion of the 3rd Louisiana down wire road in response to Seigel's attack. Other troops soon joined in the movement and made contact with Seigel's skirmishers, who were pushed back. Seigel mistook some pelicans wearing gray uniforms for some gray clad companies of the 1st Iowa who served under a lion and ordered his men not to fire. They proved to be Confederates after they fired de a devastating volley and charged. Southern artillery opened fire at this time, forcing most of the Federals to flee from the battlefield. Now, McCulloch regrouped his infantry and focused his attention on Lyon. The rest of the battle was fought on Bloody Hill, as the Confederates made three assaults. Lyon positioned 2,800 infantry and 10 guns in line of the crest. 2,000 troops under Price attacked supported by four guns, but the attack was uncoordinated due to ground cover, ravines, and slopes, contours, combined with the inexperience of the Confederates making the attack. Armed with shotguns and smoothbore flintlock muskets, they opened fire from ranges of 20 to 100 yards from the Union line. At about 7.30, Price ordered his troops back, unsuccessful in taking the hill. Before the second attack commenced, two cavalry units unsuccessfully attempted to turn the Union right flank. At about 9 o'clock, the second attack began. Lyon now had 3,500 men and 10 guns in line, and the regular infantry battalion in reserve. After an hour of intense fighting, the attack ceased. During the fight, Lyon was slightly wounded by a bullet grazing his white, right calf. The second bullet soon grazed his head. With blood running down his face, he limped to a relatively safe location behind the line where he was joined by Major John McAllister Schofield, whom he told, Major, I'm afraid the day is lost. The Major convinced him to stay in the fight. The General rode back to the front, but was soon struck by a bullet which tore through his chest. Mortally wounded, General Nathaniel Lyon died at around 9.30 a.m., the first Union general to die in the Civil War. The fight continued for another 30 minutes before Price disengaged and withdrew. Now that General Lyons is dead, Major Samuel Sturgis has assumed command of the Union forces, seeing as Colonel Seigel has retreated from the field. By this time, there have been heavy casualties and two Confederate assaults have been repulsed. The soldiers are exhausted, thirsty, and hungry, and hot. It has been 15 hours since they have eaten. Sturgis is in a tough situation. There has been no word from Seigel. And Sturgis knew that if Seigel didn't show up soon, that he must retreat. While meeting up with his senior officers, Sturgis noticed a column moving across Wilson's Creek and assumed it was Seigel. The flag appeared to be U.S. Sturgis ordered an advance, but before the order could be carried out, a 1,000-yard line of battle came into view consisting of Missouri, Arkansas, 
and Confederate units. This was the third assault that consisted of 5,000 men and artillery support. The Union Center came under intense attack in what was the most intense fighting of the battle. The Union guns fired canister shots into the Confederate ranks. Some of these men came within 20 feet of the muzzles. The fighting was brutal, but after 45 minutes, Price again ordered a withdrawal. Well aware that he couldn't hold out forever, as his men were exhausted and low on ammunition, and no word from Seigel, Sturgis began to withdraw his troops from the battlefield at around 11.30 a.m. Only Union casualties remained on Bloody Hill by 12.30 p.m. as Confederates marched up the hill unopposed. The Southerners were also very exhausted and low on ammunition. And after a brief exchange with the Union rear guard, did not pursue the retreating column. The Battle of Wilson's Creek is over. Between, between the 16,400 forces engaged, there were 2,330 total casualties, 1,235 Union and 1,095 Confederate. The battle was a Confederate victory. The battle earned the nickname Bull Run of the West. The reality is sinking in. The war will be a long and difficult struggle more so than anyone anticipated.